So in this lecture, we're going to be learning about the fascinating cultures that occupied the ancient Aegean region, which was located in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, these were the people who were the geographic forefathers to the ancient Greeks. They lived in the region that will eventually become Greece, but they also are the cultural forefathers of the Greeks as well. Many of their artistic traditions later are adopted by the Greeks as well. So the ancient Aegean world, it comprises of three cultural groups. You have this people of the Cycladic Islands, which is that collection of islands in the center of the map. You have the people of Crete, um, and these uh, people sometimes are referred to as Minoans, and Crete is the large island on the bottom of the map. And then you have the people of the Helladic mainland, the Mycenaeans, and the Helladic mainland is located on the left side of the map. Now, out of all of the maps that I've shown you in this class so far, there's been one commonality in the geographic makeup, and that is water. Now, clearly that's the case here, but we see a lot more of it because we're looking at people who lived on islands or peninsulas. And so that being the case, the sea was very important to their lives. And it wasn't just the sea as a source of food, but it also was an important avenue for trade. These were seafaring people. And also the sea acted as a form of defense. It's very hard to sneak up on someone if you have to like drive up your boat, stop it, anchor it, get on another boat, go to shore, anchor those boats, unload, get on to shore. It's a whole to do. Now with the mainland, if you look at the map, you can see that the sea wasn't quite the natural barrier as it would be for an island. Because there's a peninsula, there's a land bridge, which did make it possible for people to come down from the north and potentially invade. And um, this is probably why, you know, in comparison to the people of the Cycladic Islands in Crete, we tend to see Mycenaeans more with a focus on warfare, which will be something that we'll address when we look at the art. Now, we're going to be looking at three different cultures under this blanket term known as the Aegean. Now, I'm going to do something different than what I normally do. Normally, I would group this by culture. But instead, I'm going to group this by chronological framework, by time. And by doing this, I'm going to I encourage us to compare and contrast. And I think that'll give us a deeper understanding of the, these people and their really sophisticated artwork. So this means that you're going to want to be sure that with each slide that you're noting the cultural group since we're going back and forth. Now, I'd also like to just make another comment about the broad chronological designations that I have for you up here on the top of the chart. These are periods that have been established by scholars and they coordinate with what's known as the palatial system, palaces, think of it like that. So on the island of Crete, and this was, you know, starting in the proto-palatial period, you begin to see the formation of palaces. There's four of them, maybe five, there's some debate there. Uh, but there's four that scholars can agree on. And the idea was that you had power that was split across the island amongst these four, maybe five palatial centers. And this was not equal. Um, you've got Knossos, which you have a reconstruction here on the screen. That was the most powerful of the palaces. And we'll talk more about this palace and the palatial system a little bit later in the, the lecture. The idea is that, you know, you have the time before the palaces, the pre-palatial. You've got the proto-palatial when it's just starting to emerge, the neo-palatial when the palaces are at their height, and then the post-palatial when the palatial system is in decline. Now, for most of the history of the ancient Aegean, Crete was the dominant cultural group. So each culture did have their own chronological system. But to keep things simple, I'm just going to work with the palatial periods and use that to mark our time. So you'll want to note, you know, the culture and then you'll want to note the period. You don't need to know dates. And I do have early, middle, late Minoan, but you don't need to uh, have that as well. Just focus on the, the palatial designation 
and you'll be good in terms of chronology. Now, one of the things that presents a challenge to scholars is there's not as much evidence as we would like for us to examine in comparison to other ancient cultures. Um, you've got Mesopotamia in Egypt, tons of archaeological and textual evidence, and unfortunately, that is not the case with the Aegeans. Now, when we talk about evidence, there are three primary types. You've got artistic evidence, which is the artwork. You've got archaeological evidence, which is the material culture, the objects they left behind. And then you have the textual evidence. And this is the part that really complicates things for scholars because the Cycladic people, they were a prehistoric culture. As far as we know, they didn't create the written word. Now in Crete, they were not prehistoric, but they weren't exactly historic in the sense that they had two scripts. They had the Cretan hieroglyphic script and they had linear A. Neither of these have been translated. Then you have the Mycenaean text, which is linear B. This text has been translated, but we need to be very careful. And this is why. A lot of scholars like to use linear B to interpret the culture and history of Crete and the people of the Cycladic Islands. The issue is, though, is that the Mycenaeans were a different culture, so their worldviews and the way they lived may have not been the same as their other Aegean counterparts. Also, the Mycenaeans came on the scene a lot later than the emergence of the people of Crete in the Neolithic period, and same with the Cycladis people, also Neolithic. So much later on is the history of the Mycenaeans. So their texts really only address the later years of Cretan history. Third, Linear B was an economic and an administrative text. So it only provides insight into a fraction of what life was like back then. We don't get a sense about religious beliefs or social life, or even really any idea about the lived experiences of everyday people like you and me. The point is, is that a lot of what you're going to learn about in this lecture continues to be debated among scholars, which I personally think is great. I think it makes for a very vibrant and dynamic field of art history. It's great to be an Aegeanist. All right, so let's start with the, the pre-palatial period. Now here we've got this great example of a Cycladic sculpture. This is a very common type of sculpture known as the folded arm figure, or FAF, which, as you can see, describes sculptures with uh, people whose arms are folded. And this is uh, very common to have that. And there's some other things that are common. Uh, these FAFs are made from marble. They are all nude. They are all very flat and angular. Or maybe we might want to say geometric in their appearance. So when I say geometric and angular, what I'm talking about is how the body has very sharp edges. You can see that in like the kind of square shape that the arms make that are folded. You've got triangle shapes in the shape of the nose as well as the pubic triangle. And then very sharp lines that delineate the shoulders, the arms, that sort of thing. Now, again, these, these characteristics that I've just described, they're very consistent. They all, the FAF figures, they all pretty much look like this with some differences in size and some subtle differences with shape, which is what happens when each sculpture is being made individually. There's gonna be slight variations, uh, but otherwise very consistent where you can look at this and you can see, okay, it's very easy to identify that you're looking at an FAF. Now, one thing that's noteworthy feature on this sculpture and others like it is you can see there's disproportionately small feet. These are feet that are so small that they would not have been able to hold the body upright. And therefore it indicates that this sculpture was made to either be handheld or made to be lying down. Now, this is an interesting point when you consider where these sculptures were primarily found in burial sites, in what we call cyst graves. Cyst graves are like small box-like graves that, at least in the case of the Cycladis, 
were consistent in form. They were a rectangular pit that was dug in the ground, lined with stone slabs, covered with a stone slab roof. So sculptures like this were found in graves and they were a part of a wider assemblage of grave goods. And so additional things we could find would be stuff like jewelry or weapons or pottery. So the question, could these be representations of the deceased that are put in graves? And the answer to that is probably not. The reason why is that these sculptures almost entirely depicted women. So unless we have like a Wonder Woman situation where we have an island full of badass women going around kicking people, then likely this is not the case. Because of the nude female body and the emphasis on the breasts and pubic triangle, some scholars have suggested that these were sort of like amulets that you would put into the grave and that they would help you be born into the afterlife. Now, thinking about this further, I want to point out another interesting detail about these figurines, that many of them were originally painted, and they were painted with details such as jewelry, or they articulated facial features, they created patterns or linear markings. Now, we can't see it here because in many cases, the pigment was very fragile and it fades away, but you can see traces with a microscope. Now, in some of these sculptures, like this one here, this has fared a bit better, and you can see uh, the patterns that are put in. And there's been some really interesting arguments proposed about the function of these figures based on the traces of paint. Some have argued that rather than these being funerary items, items that were for graves, you know, to help you get reborn into the afterlife, that rather, or maybe in addition to, these were used during life. The fragile nature of the paint would actually allow for these to be painted over again. So that would allow the sculpture to be customized based on certain religious or social events. And this argues further, this argument's further supported by the fact that many of these figurines show evidence of repair, that they were broken and then they were fixed. Now, in terms of what religious or social events would warrant the painting of a sculpture like this, many studies I've read have suggested that they are related to female rites of passage, that new painted embellishments would be applied, for example, when a woman started menstruating or when she became a wife or a bride. A, bride, a wedding is the ultimate rite of passage. Now, while the cyclitic figurines are almost overwhelmingly female, there are a few examples of males. Here's a couple that we see here. And I think at this point, these two are just under a total of 10, that um, no, the number of male sculptures that have been found. So really not, not many at all, comparatively. And um, we can see, though, that they are executed in that same distinct cyclatic approach with those simple cylindrical and geometric forms. But what makes the male figures distinct is that their poses are more complicated and they're depicted in various guises, such as playing instruments, like what we're seeing here. These male figures really stump scholars because there's so few of them and most cycladic tombs didn't have these. So to just say that, oh, these are grave goods that could be an oversimplified interpretation that we might want to reconsider. And because we don't have written words for this cultural group, what it means really is that we need more archaeological evidence to further understand the, uh, the significance surrounding these male sculptures. Now we'll return to the Cycladic Islands later on in this lecture, but for now let's move on to Crete and talk about palaces. Now, in the second millennium, there was a significant shift in Cretan settlement patterns. Prior, in the third millennium, settlements were relatively small, scattered throughout the island, but in the second millennium, we start to see the construction of large ornate palaces, and eventually four palace sites emerge. I have them circled on the map, and then the one with the question mark is the fifth one that scholars are still uh, debating about. The issue is, is that 
it's not as large as the other palaces, but it does have palatial architectural features. And it might make it like a small palace, but then other people say maybe it's just a very prestigious domestic and administrative center, Aya Triada. We really don't know. Anyhow, these new settlements, they are centered around these palace structures. And indeed, the palaces were the center of almost all aspects of daily life. This was where political and economic administration occurred. This is where religious rites were performed and community gatherings took place in large courts, like that large central court that you can see in the reconstruction of the palace at Knossos. Now, since we're talking about palaces, you might be thinking about a king. However, we don't have evidence to support such a claim. For example, we have no texts that describe any Cretan kings, nor do we have any artistic evidence, such as portraits of kings. Now, a very tantalizing idea was that maybe Crete was a matriarchy, that Crete was ruled by women. Now, this is very controversial among Aegean scholars, and as of yet, we don't have any solid evidence that this was true. But what makes this persistent theory keep coming up over and over again throughout the years is that there's a lot of artistic representations of women coming out of Crete. They were very visible. And in many of the images, the women appear in positions of power, which we can ascertain through things like hierarchical scale or through uh, certain iconographic symbols. We actually don't know what the political system of Crete was. I believe that it was either an oligarchy ruled by a small group of people or a plutocracy, that it was ruled by the rich. We do have plenty of images of rich people. I'll show you some examples. And we do have plenty of archeological evidence in the form of material culture, really lovely jewelry, pottery, clothing. And with the, the painting on the right, you know, you not only see gorgeous garments, that are constructed, which was rare in the ancient world, and uh, very fine fabrics, but then you see all the jewelry that's being worn as well. So clearly there, there's some wealth here. And I wanna point out, you know, that these palaces, they were in control of the trade, they were in control of the economy. They also were the major commissioners of artwork and architecture. So they played a very important role in guiding artistic styles and trends. Now we're going to look at a few examples of artwork that came from the most powerful of the palaces, the palace at Knossos. Now on the palace interior, the walls were covered with lovely fresco paintings. And when we're saying fresco, what we're referring to is painting on plaster. Now there's two types of fresco painting. You have Buon, which was known as like the true fresco, which is painting on wet plaster where you take the pigment, you put it on to wet plaster, and as the plaster dries, it absorbs the pigment, making it a permanent part of the wall. This is the most durable of the two fresco painting approaches. With fresco secco, this is dry, the wall is dry, and you mix your painting, your pigment with a binder, and then you put it on to the surface of the wall. The issue is, is there are two separate layers. So over time, moisture can get between the two and the top layer will flake off. What the Crete, the Crete artists did, and this is very smart, is they actually used a combination of both. They had the permanence of the fresco painting, but what's nice about fresco secco is you don't have to wait for um, the plaster to dry. So that means that you have whatever timeline you want. You don't have to work and then your plaster dries and, and all of that. It's already dry. So you can go as slow as you want, which allows for more, uh, more detail. Now in this fresco painting here, we can't be too certain of the subject matter. It seems like the, most of the paintings at the palace depicted scenes of daily religious life for the people of Crete. Um, an example here would be bowl leaping, which likely was a ritual sport. Now, who exactly is participating is unclear. 
We know from our Egypt lecture that there was a tradition of depicting males with dark skin, females with light skin. So it looks like it's two females, one male. However, the issue is the clothing. The two individuals with the light skin, they're wearing male clothing. And the people of Crete were pretty clear about clothing and not being ambiguous when it came to using clothing to articulate the different genders. So this, the, the, these people are wearing male clothing. Now, what it makes me wonder is if we're looking at some sort of initiation ritual. The males would have the light skin because they have not yet been granted that social category of man. But the male in the middle, who's demonstrating this great feat of bravery by doing an acrobatic maneuver over a gigantic bull, perhaps because he's completed this feat or is in the process of doing so, he is being considered a quote unquote man. And I just wanna say, I love this painting. It's so full of energy, which is so appropriate for the subject matter. What we're looking at, we've got this giant organic shape, the size alone conveying the power of the animal. And that shape really helps convey a sense of movement, which is aided by the diagonal lines of the legs, which we know diagonal lines also work to convey movement. And then there's this great warm, cool color contrast that also imbues this piece with a sense of energy and a sense of life. So good. Now the artists of Crete, they didn't make any large scale sculpture. So this makes this sculpture coming in at just over a foot exceptional. Now when I'm saying exceptional, I'm not meaning exceptional in terms of super fantastic, which obviously it is, but I'm talking about exceptional in the terms of the word exception which is an exception rather than the norm. This sculpture brings us back to another reason why people think Crete could have been a matriarchy. The religious figures in the religious art of Crete, they were overwhelmingly women, which makes some scholars think that the people of Crete were monotheistic and that they worshiped a single goddess. Now this would be very, very rare for the ancient world, not only to have monotheism, but that that one God would be a woman. Now, if you want to know my opinion, I'm not sure. I definitely know, I think most Aegean scholars would agree, they worship goddesses. And they did that more so than gods. And what I think is that they either worshipped multiple goddesses, or if they were monotheistic, it was one goddess with multiple personas. But again, we don't have enough evidence to really be certain about their religious practices. Now, as to what we're looking at in this sculpture, there's debate. Scholars believe that it could be either a goddess or a priestess. And at first glance, it's hard for us to initially tell because in the art of Crete, they depicted their priestess the same way they depicted their goddesses, and they tend to wear similar clothing. But I think if we look past that, we can see that there are clues that indicate we are looking at a goddess. So what are these clues? Iconography. First, she is a feline sitting on her head. Now we know typically that feline animals, like lions and leopards and those sort of creatures, that they represent protection. And protection is certainly something we would like a goddess to do, to protect us and that which we care about. But this, line, this feline, this ferocious creature, is docile. It sits serenely on this figure's head, which signifies her control over the natural world. And that would be definitely a feature of a goddess. She also holds a snake in each hand, and that also would symbolize control. Now, some have suggested that these snakes operate as a phallic symbol. Phallic symbols are symbols that are visually evocative of a penis. And we don't always associate the penis with fertility, but perhaps we can here. And it would suggest that this goddess oversaw the fertility of plants, animals, and people, which would be hugely important to an agrarian society, such as the people of Crete. Now, snakes also represent death in the underworld. So maybe these symbols are meant to be an indication that she controls life and death, um, which is pretty powerful. 
I also believe this is a representation of a goddess because, as I said earlier, she's exceptional. So this is a very special and rare work of art. The other thing is this image is repeated. It doesn't only show up in this sculpture, but it also shows up carved into seals. And repetition, repeating something, implies that it's important. Now we don't get an opportunity to talk about ceramics very much in this class, so I'm definitely going to take the opportunity here because the artists of Crete were crazy good potters. Their work was very sophisticated and part of this has to do with the newly introduced potter's wheel. Potter's wheel is a disc that spins around, allowing you to shape the pottery, achieving thin, evenly um, dense walls. And if you're not sure what a pottery wheel is, go to YouTube and type in ghost and pottery wheel, and you'll get a pretty clear sense of things. It's a scene from the movie Ghost, and you'll definitely like see how to throw on the wheel and maybe see how pottery can go in a sexual direction. The other thing that made the pottery so sophisticated were, were the designs, and you can clearly see that here. On the left, you have an octopus. There's one painted on the front and the back. In addition to that, you've got seaweed and triton shells and sea urchin. This very dense collection of imagery, and we refer to this as horror vacui, which means the fear of empty spaces. It's a very common design in Cretan pottery to really fill up so you don't have a lot of empty space. You've got the shape of the octopus and it's got these great tentacles that creep around the body of the vessel. And by doing that, it really helps to emphasize this exaggerated roundness of the form. And uh, the other thing too we wanna keep in mind is that you know, you've got these designs, you've got these shapes. On top of that, you have really nice craftsmanship. They're well-made. And so these made these uh, pottery vessels very valuable. They were prized on the international and domestic trade markets, very prestigious. We have um, on the right, another really great example. This is a polychromed example, meaning multiple colors, where you have this, this leaping fish. And then the lower shape, is the net, which kind of reflects the, the shape of the fish. So there's a lovely balance there. And then surrounding this is you know undulating lines and swirled patterns, and these likely suggest the movement of the sea. Very, very nice. And you know, with both of these vessels, we're looking at marine motifs, the sea, and that was also very common in Crete pottery to have sea life which again speaks to the importance that the sea played in the lives of these people. Now, as promised, we're returning to the Cycladic Islands, to the island of Thera, to take a look at an incredible Cycladic painting. Now, I'm sure you've heard the story of Pompeii. Back in the first century CE, there was a volcano by the name of Vesuvius and it erupted and its ash completely buried the Roman city of Pompeii, perfectly preserving it. Well, the same thing happened at Thera, at the site of Akrotiri. It was buried in ash from a volcano preserving these paintings. So like our bull painting, this too is a fresco, but thanks for it being buried in ash, it's one of the best preserved paintings that we have to come out of the ancient Aegean. This is very, very valuable to scholars. Now this painting has been called Young Crocus Gatherers. And um, in Aegean art, artists were very clear about the representation of age. That's why we're calling them young. What indicates we're looking at young people is that the girls have short hair. You can see they have underdeveloped breasts and then they've got calf length kilts which was the garment worn by young people. And it's believed that what we're looking at is one scene out of a larger cycle of frescoes that adorn the walls of room 3A at Zesty 3, which was a site that accommodated female initiation rites. And one thing that gives us a clue to this is inside this room, 3A, 
there was evidence of religious rituals, particularly what was called a lustral basin. And a lustral basin is essentially like a sunken pool that was commonly used uh, for initiation. Now, if you look at the clothing, it's religious, okay? She's got the open bodice. And if you go back, it's the same thing that we see here. So open bodice revealing the breasts. This is a, a cultic costume. So we know there's something religious happening here. Now I've done extensive research on this painting. And I think that not only is this indeed an image that was part of a rite of passage, one that prepared young girls to become women and then become brides and then become wives and then become mothers. But the point of the image was to transmit information, specifically how to use plants to care for sexual and reproductive health. They are collecting crocus flowers and crocus and the saffron it produces was well documented by ancient sources from all different cultures as a way to cure uterine, uterine hemorrhages, uterine hemorrhages, childbirth pain, menstrual cramping. It was also documented as a very effective aphrodisiac and a contraceptive, which functions similar to our morning after pill. And modern testing has corroborated the efficacy of this plant. It identifies that there is a unique chemical composition of phytoestrogens, terpenes, and uh, prosglandin, which replicate the female sex hormone. The idea was that if one became sexually active, that it was best to take care of the body so that they could have healthy and successful pregnancies. Now we move on to our third and final culture of the Aegean world, and that is the Mycenaeans. Now at the end of the Neopalatial period, Crete was essentially in decline. It was losing its prominence as the major power of the Mediterranean. And to fill this power vacuum, we have the ascendancy of the Mycenaeans who lived on the Greek mainland. The Greek mainland consisted of several large citadels, which were like walled fortresses, as you can see from the examples here. These walls were very strong and they were very thick. So they were definitely functional for sure. And they're so strong and thick that they have been named Cyclopean after the mythical giant Cyclops. Now this contrast to the large sprawling Cretan palaces that did not have fortifications because they had that natural barrier to the sea, where again, the Mycenaeans are living on the mainland, so they didn't have that natural protection. So again, this is hinting to this more warfare-based culture in comparison to the people of Crete and the Cycladic Islands. Now, if you look in the middle, you can see that in the reconstruction, you can see that large, lighter colored, large structure. That likely was the Megaron, which was a large room and it was a reception room. And uh, inside that reception room, the king, also known as the Wanix, presided. Now you may have noticed I said king, and that's an important difference between the people of Crete and the Mycenaeans. We do have evidence of centralized power in the form of kingship within the Mycenaean culture. Now your typical Megaron, it's gonna have a throne in it on one end of the room. There'd be a hearth at the center and then four columns to hold up the roof. And it's been suggested that this combination of features, the throne, the hearth, the columns, that this formed the prototype of the earliest Greek temples. Here's a pretty epic entrance to the citadel located at the site of Mycenae, which was added during the site's second expansion. And this is nice because it gives us a good up close view of Cyclopean masonry as well. What you have here is a giant limestone relief of two lions with their legs up on an altar. And this altar type uh, is one that we saw a lot in Crete, just throwing that out there, and flanking a tall column. Now what's noteworthy about this sculpture is that first of all, it's the only known example of Mycenaean architectural sculpture. So sculpture integrated into a building. 
And it's the only known example of Mycenaean monumental sculpture, meaning large sized sculpture. Now, again, this is not unique to Mycenaean, what we're seeing. That altar that the lions stand on, that is Crete. And this idea of the column also could be also something that we, we see coming from Crete as well. And these things we see in Crete as early as the 15th century BCE. Now, regardless of the origins, the point is, is this is meant to be an image that was a testament to strength and power. And that is appropriate in terms of a culture that at this time was at the height of its power. Now, of course, we understand <clears throat> the symbolism of the lion. It's come up quite a bit in this class. <coughs> And it's the same thing here. <clears throat> They're symbols of protection and royal power. And that idea of protection makes a lot of sense, considering that the sculpture is placed at a doorway. It reminds me of the Sphinx of Egypt and the Lama Sioux of Mesopotamia. Now, if you look closely, look at the column and then look at the lion on the right. And you can see on his head, there's like a little hole. What's interesting is that is a dowel hole, which indicates that the heads were sculpted separately and stuck on so that even though you're seeing the lions in profile, their face is facing out towards you, which I personally think would be pretty intimidating. Now we'll finish up this lecture by looking at the burial traditions of the Mycenaeans, starting with their tombs. In the second part of the late Bronze Age, we see Mycenaeans begin to construct monumental burial mounds that we call tholos or tholoi, plural. And tholos is Greek for round building. These were located outside of the citadel walls. And what's significant about them is that they convey a vast amount of wealth and power for the individuals who were entombed within. Now again, this evidence is this idea that during the Mycenaean period, more so than at Crete, we have this more centralized power rather than power being shared by a group or spread across an island amongst four, maybe five palatial centers. Now, we don't know who was buried here, and it's, it's very tempting to do the A word and assume that it would be a king. But I think the safest thing to do is to just say that a ridiculously rich person was buried here and leave it at that. And if they're that rich, they're obviously going to be powerful. Now, we call this the Treasury of Atreus, which isn't the most accurate name because this is a tomb. It's not a treasury. But upon its discovery, there were so many riches inside that it was mistaken for a treasury. The tomb part which was a discreet burial chamber placed on the side of the structure underground, escaped initial notice in the face of all of the pretty things. The tomb is fronted by an entryway, this path, which is called the Dromos. And uh, that space certainly creates a dramatic entry to the front of the tomb. But the space may also have accommodated feasting rituals that were held by the descendants of who was entombed within. And that would be another tradition that would be a carryover from Crete. Now we can look at the inside and then we can see really what makes the Tholos so unique. We know that many ancient cultures created burial mounds, but what sets the Mycenaean approach apart is the distinctive beehive shape of its interior. You can see that it's an exceedingly well-built structure it's created using the corbeling or load-bearing process of stacking stones. And in fact, this structure was so well-built that it was the largest unsupported freestanding space in the world when this was built. So what that means is there were no columns or any other type of internal support holding it up, just the ingenious engineering of the Aegeans. And this remained the largest unsupported freestanding space for approximately 1,500 years until the Romans built the Pantheon. And the only way the Romans were able to surpass what the Mycenaeans did is just because they had developed a new building technology 
which was concrete. Now, did I skip? I guess, okay. So the treasury of Atreus was also called the tomb of Agamemnon, who was Atreus' son, which brings me to another Agamemnon-related funerary piece, the mask of Agamemnon, which in this group here is the one on the top left. This death mask was made from beaten gold, and it was not found in the treasury of Atreus, but it was found in another type of Mycenaean burial site known as a shaft grave. And the shaft grave was likely the precursor to the tholos. With shaft graves, they were small graves. They are placed together within a circular wall. Now, before we move on, I want to encourage some caution here. Agamemnon was a character in Homer's Iliad. And I want to remind you that Homer who may not have even been an actual person, but could have been like a concept or a description of a group of roaming bards. Homer wrote fiction. This is not historical text. We don't know the actual name of the person who had this burial mask. And there's been even the suggestion that this mask itself could be a forgery. So caution abounds. Now this mask, as you can see, was one of just a handful of masks that have been discovered as of yet. And we can definitely see that there is some variation in terms of quality. These masks were made to cover the face of the deceased person. Now, if you look at them, you can see that there are differences among the masks, which encourages the argument that these were intended to reflect the individual likeness of each of these people. And if we want to compare to other cultures, I'm thinking of Egypt here particularly, you know, there is this tradition of including a likeness of the deceased within a burial site. Now, what's noteworthy about this is it's this attempt towards portraiture. And that was not something that we saw in the art of the other Aegean cultures, Crete or Cycladic. Now, these masks were not found on their own, but they were found alongside other grave goods including fancy libation vessels, which indicate wealth, just in case you didn't recognize the wealth with the gold mask. There were also weapons, which indicates that these prominent men were likely also warriors. Now, as I said earlier, these masks are made from a sheet of gold and they were formed by creating a wood bottom, a wood base, and then they would put the sheet of gold over the wood and then they would hammer down. Now, important part of the masks are the facial hair. And we see this, it's especially great with the mask of Agamemnon, with these carefully articulated beards and mustaches, which recall beards are really an important part of conveying masculinity, but the beards also convey age, which in turn conveys wisdom. And, you know, these references to masculinity, they bring forth stereotypes like strength, aggression, bravery, and that would be appealing to uh, have those associations being part of a military culture. And, you know, the wisdom would make for a great tactician and a great leader. Now, before I end this lecture, I do want to ask a very important question. Is it me or do you think that this particular gold mask looks like the actor Tom Hiddleston? <laughs>